Beloved, it is a pleasure to be with you once again, to greet you in the Lord's name and on behalf of our ministry, Family Voice Australia. Our message today is entitled, Ministering as Salt and Light. That's our topic for today, Ministering as Salt and Light. And we will look today at, firstly, understanding how Christians are constituted as salt and and light and secondly we will look at influencing with savor lip smacking savor as the salt of the earth and then we will turn to shining brightly as the light of the world and then serving Christ the light of the world who is king by a covenant of salt and then we will look practically as to how we can minister as salt and light. Well, if you have a Bible handy, turn with me to Matthew's Gospel in the fifth chapter, where Jesus gives his classic statement about how we as God's people are constituted as salt and light. So Matthew chapter 5 provides our text for today. And reading from verse 13, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth but if the salt loses its saltiness how can it be made salty again it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men you are the light of the world a city on a hill cannot be hidden Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the scriptures. Well, we begin today with a quotable quotation. Better to light a candle than curse the darkness. What a great old saying that is. Better to light a candle than curse the darkness. I do have a candle here, and I'll light that a little bit later in the message with my good old redhead matches. And I'll say something now which may seem very strange, but I'm deadly serious as I say this. Thank God these matches have red heads. So hold that thought and we'll come back to that at the end of the message, Lord willing. Well, in his challenging Sermon on the Mount, our Lord Jesus told his disciples that they are constituted as the light of the world and the salt of the earth. This is who we are in him. And so as we serve accordingly, our ministry does not arise as some kind of a specialised action that may belong to a particular ministry and not to others. Nor should it be something that we might aspire to achieve at some point in the future. Oh no, it is who we are in him. If you are in Christ today, you are the salt and you are the light. It's not something that we've got to develop. It's who we are. Yes, we need to make sure we are living that out because we have control over, over our behaviour. But there's nothing that needs to be changed within, as it were. We just need to let out the reality. You are the salt of the earth, Jesus said. You are the light of the world. It's who we are in him, but it does require ambition for God's glory. Now this passage speaks about people doing their good deeds publicly so that God would be praised. The same Jesus who spoke about doing things publicly also said that some things should be done privately and he contrasts the scribes and the Pharisees and others who love to pray on the street corners and they love to do their charitable works in public and Jesus says, no, those people, they should learn to pray in their closet. 
and they should do their charity in such a way that the right hand would, know, would not know what the left is doing. How come the apparent contradiction? Well, it's very simple. It's to do with the heart. If we are like that proud man that wants recognition for his own great charity works and recognition for the wonderful oratory of his prayers, they are of no value. He's received his reward. But if we learn to be humble, then God, in fact, wants to exalt us. And as we are humble and are happy that our works of charity be done privately with no recognition, no glory for me, and our prayers are quiet little prayers that no one else is hearing, but God is hearing, when we get to that point, we are then taken to an, uh, an area of promotion, we might say, in the kingdom of God. And that is that we are called to do these works, not privately, but publicly, because we want the glory to go to God. John the Baptist said, he must become greater and I must become less. When we get to that point of being happy to be less, God, in fact, wants us to become greater. Those who honour me, I will honour, says the Lord. So the proud people who do their works because they like them to be done before men to be seen by them must learn. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. It's in Matthew 6 that we read those excellent words of Jesus. He also said, Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So to be a Christian, in fact, is to be exalted. But we get to that point through the path of humility. So we aim for humility, but we end up with exaltation. It's a remarkable thing. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And really that's what it is to be salt and light, isn't it? Because of the wonderful impact of salt and light that we'll come to in a few minutes. It is God's plan that humble people will be lifted up so that their good work done in public may exalt the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. And in that way we serve with savour, lip-smacking savour. Have you ever gone to the packet of chips and you think, yeah, I'll just have one of those chips or a couple of those chips? The taste goes into your mouth and you say, mmm, that is good, oh, that is good. And suddenly the whole packet's been devoured because the savour makes it so good and so delicious for us. We are to serve with savour as the salt of the earth. We're to reflect the brightness of Christ as, to quote our Lord Jesus once again, the sons of light. He calls his people the sons of light. That would make a great name for a new church, wouldn't it? The sons of light. So that all humanity will glorify our Lord, the light of the world. His kingship, we receive as co-heirs with him, is established forever by a covenant of salt. And we'll come back to that as the message unfolds. Turning now to our work, influencing with savour, as the salt of the earth. Jesus said you are the salt of the earth and we need to recognise the wonderful qualities of salt. Since we are constituted in him with salty characteristics, we need to understand what is the value and the application and the efficacy or the outcome or the results of being salt. Well, we can summarise those qualities as follows. Salt penetrates and it brings cleansing and it brings healing and it brings preservation and it brings flavour. It is linked to judgement and without salt we die, therefore salt gives life. So those are seven qualities of salt that I commend to you this morning. Salt penetrates and brings cleansing and healing and preservation and flavour is linked to judgment and brings life. There's so much there for us to unpack, to recognise what it means when Jesus said, 
about his disciples. You are the salt of the earth. Now, today, salt is cheap. You know, you can get salt straightforwardly and in a very pure form. But in the ancient world, to get pure salt was very difficult and it was worth quite some money. And it has all of these wonderful virtues. Salt penetrates to bring cleansing. You can use it to scour and to bleach. It's a powerful agent. And though it may sting when it's applied, when we mix it with water to make that salt solution, applying it to a wound, it will promote healing. I've heard of some missionaries overseas who had run out of the necessary medication, but they had some good old Aussie Vegemite, and so they put that onto the wound, and it assisted to bring healing, because, of course, Vegemite is not only delicious, um, although that's a matter of taste, I suppose. You, you either love it or you hate it, but it's loaded with salt. I suppose that's why it tastes so good, and it has healing properties if you're really desperate. So while salt stings, it is bringing healing. How sad that some of us as Christians were a bit afraid of offending people, of having that stinging outcome to our words. Not that we're seeking to offend or upset anyone, but how tragic that we would resile from our salty ministry because oh, it might upset a few people, it might sting as it's being applied. That's not good enough, is it? Well, even in this modern era of refrigeration, salt is still used as a means of food preservation. It's one of those great qualities of salt. It, it's a preservative. It stops things going rotten. This is who we are in Christ. We stop things going rotten. Salt also brings flavor to tasteless food. Job famously in the sixth chapter of his book speaks about his inability to eat tasteless food such as the white of an egg and there are some foods that are just so bland but we like to say that salt brings out the flavor uh, I'm not sure whether it really brings out the flavor or adds flavor but either way that tasteless food is given savor by the salt this is who we are in Christ would to God that people enjoy the flavor of uh, the taste, if you like, of being around Christians. They're glad to be around Christians because, mm, yep, there's something there that's really good, really good value. Salt is also linked to judgment. We read in Genesis chapter 19, of course, that Lot's wife became a pillar of salt. And in the book of Jeremiah, the 48th chapter and verse 9, God says, put salt on Moab, for she will be laid in other nations, of making sure that they will not be productive anymore. Their soil will be poisoned uh, because salt has that poisoning quality or a judging quality. Uh, the Greek word pharmakon means both uh, medicine and poison. So it depends on the quantity. And people are perpetually overdosing with vitamins because if they think that a few pills will be good, then lots will be even better. It doesn't work that way. You can have too much of a good thing in that sense. And Jesus remarkably in Mark chapter 9 says, everyone will be salted with fire. Everyone will be salted with fire. Again, he's speaking about the role of salt in judgment. And finally, of course, without salt we become sick and die. When I was a young man, I worked uh, in BHP in Wyala, uh, the steelworks there, and uh, we were doing a lot of sweating all day there on the hot day and we were forever running over to get, get some more of those good salt drinks that the management uh, laid on for us so that we could replenish the salts that were being lost through perspiration. In a Western countries like Australia, it's probably unlikely that any one of us would not have enough salt because uh, it's in so many of the foods that we buy readily prepared. But in other parts of the world, it's a real issue. And often soldiers uh, in Victorian times particularly would be given salt tablets uh, to help them as they were coping with the hot weather. Because you see, without salt, we die. It's as simple as that. So when Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, all of these qualities about salt should come to mind 
It's our ministry as his people to penetrate, to cleanse, to bring healing, preservation, flavor, to be instrumental even in judgment, but above all to bring life to the world. What a glorious constituted quality it is for us to recognize that we are the salt of the earth. And still reflecting on how the ancients understood salt, let me refer to the writings of Pliny the Elder, writing in the first century AD, his book Natural History. He said, even in the very honors, too, that are bestowed upon successful warfare, salt plays its part, and from it our word solarium is derived. Hence the view that the Latin solarium, meaning salary, comes from salus, salt, which was so valuable a commodity that it formed part of the Roman soldiers' remuneration, the salt money. Uh, still going back to my time as uh, a labourer at BHP in Wyala, uh, we would have our salary directly credited to our account, but there are a few diehards who'd be prepared to queue up because they wanted it in cash, and so the little envelopes would be made and they'd have notes mostly and a few coins in there. But can you imagine them tipping that out to count their fortnightly wage and some salt coming out of the packet? Uh, that would certainly provoke outrage in the modern world, but in the ancient world, as it would seem, uh, that would be the norm for the Roman soldiers. According to the, the writings of Pliny the Elder, he's our, he's our man on the spot to tell us what was going on all those years ago. So salt is a very valuable commodity in the ancient world. And still going back into those ancient times to get a handle on these things, we can look in the book of Ezra and the fourth chapter where we read about the servants of King Artaxerxes and the scripture there says that they are under obligation to the palace. But literally, in the Hebrew, it says we are salted with the salt of the palace. So that's got to be sort of translated into our modern thinking because what would we understand that to mean, salted with the salt of the palace? It really means under obligation to the palace. And the salt of the palace is that valuable commodity connected with royal service. Well, as we are the salt of the earth, our great opportunity is to let these valued qualities of salt enrich our words and our actions, as Jesus, echoed by Paul, encouraged in his words, recorded in Mark chapter 9, and then, as Paul echoes in Colossians 4, in Mark 9, Jesus says, "'Have salt among yourselves.'" and be at peace with each other. That salty quality affecting our relationships. Now Paul says in Colossians 4, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Let there be an authenticity about what we say, a savor, a winsomeness, a wisdom, about what we're saying. Let it be of lip-smacking savour in the ears of those who appreciate our ministry. And further, we read in the book of Exodus, chapter 30, that God required incense that was salted and pure. So the incense which God wanted should have salt in it. And in fact, he, he stated... In Leviticus chapter 2, season all your grain offerings with salt. Do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of your grain offerings. And of course it would be the priests who'd be consuming those grain offerings and they've got the good salt added to the offerings. Well we today are priests, we're a kingdom of priests as God's people. And we are sustained under that everlasting covenant of salt, as it's called in Numbers chapter 18 and verse 19. We're sustained under an everlasting covenant of salt. Well, what is a covenant of salt? A covenant of salt is a covenant that has all of the good qualities of salt in it. 
So may we testify to Christ with salty authenticity so that people will appreciate him as the bread of life. May that be a good savoury bread that we enjoy according to his words in John 6. May people taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 34 as they're experiencing the goodness of God through our salty ministry. May Christians offer a themselves in authentically salty priestly ministry as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to God sacrifices that are salted with the savor of God Romans 12 let's turn now to the qualities of light we've looked firstly at salt and now to light you are the salt you are the light what are the good qualities of light well there are many of those as God's people comprehend the virtuous characteristics of light shown by Jesus Christ, we become better able to apply such features in our ministry. As the light of Christ enables humanity to see the path of right living and to be warned that the fruitless deeds of darkness must be exposed by the light so they become visible, Ephesians chapter 5. That ministry of Christ is founded on scripture. Let me just read three of many portions of scripture that speak about the goodness of light. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear, says the psalmist in Psalm 27. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path, Psalm 119. The Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn, as we read in Isaiah chapter 60. How good it is to have light. Well, we, say, we take light so for granted. Uh, but when the power fails and it's the middle of the night, perhaps like me, sometimes you reach for the light switch. <laughs> no, yeah, it's like an instinct. We just assume the light will be there uh, for us to flick on and flick off. Well, may, maybe, maybe not. But how valuable it is to have light. You know, if you're going to have a breakdown of your car or a flat tyre, don't have it at night because it's so much harder. Things are ten times worse at night. Have you ever noticed that? When things go wrong, it's so handy for them to go wrong in daylight rather than in the middle of the night. So light is a really, really useful thing. Jesus, concerning him it's written, in him was life. And that life was the light of all men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it, or in some versions, overcome it. Light just has its way. When that light comes on, the cockroaches flee. You know, have you ever been in a dark room and someone comes in and puts the light on? You know, you're covering your eyes because that light is so powerful. And the burglar is much more likely to come at night rather than the day because he's sneaking around hoping that he, his deeds will not be seen. How good it is that we have light. Indeed, Jesus said of himself in the temple that was aglow during Hanukkah, the festival of lights. Reminds me of the old name of our ministry. But at the feast of Hanukkah, when the temple was ablaze with light, Jesus with great audacity says, I am the light of the world, John 8. So may we minister with that same brightness and audacity is the wrong word because that pertains to hearing, but I'm searching for another word that will help us to appreciate that the light of God just has its way. It's an unstoppable light. Have you ever tried to close your eyes and there's still that bright light you can still see? something of the light even with our eyes shut may we be so bright that we will illuminate the path of righteousness as we expose the deeds of darkness jesus christ it says in john chapter one is the true light that gives light to every man so that we may become the sons of light it's in john twelve thirty six. that lovely phrase we are the sons of light a son is someone who inherits and we are inheriting all the good things that pertain to light. It's power, it's ability to expose wrongdoing, 
its capacity to show the right path. So may everyone see our life and work and see there his light of which we are sons who are warned about the darkness. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Let's not in any way try to turn down the brightness of the light that's within us as sons of light, but rather to let it shine, as Jesus said. Let your light shine before men. We're to shine the light of God openly in the Lucan version of the opening words we've explored today, Luke chapter 8, Jesus says, No one lights a lamp and hides it in a jar or puts it under a bed. This should provoke laughter in the audience. But we tend not to laugh at the words of Jesus. We're told to be sort of too sober, I think, sometimes in church. But this would have provoked laughter. I mean, putting a lamp under the bed, what are you going to do? Set the mattress on fire? You know, I know we're, we're to set the world on fire, but it doesn't mean that. You know, so it's strange to me that we sometimes forget to laugh at some of the funny things that the Lord Jesus said. He said, no one lights a lamp and puts and hides it in a jar or puts it under a bed. Of course not. How ridiculous. Instead, he puts it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be brought out into the open. So we see Jesus really shining light when he's dealing with the rich young ruler. He sends him away to ponder the error of his materialism, his love for his riches. But Jesus does so with magnanimity, largeness of heart that could be seen in his gaze. So we read in Mark chapter 10, verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Beautiful words there. Jesus looked at him and loved him. May the light of Christ shine in our eyes with love even as we expose errors like those Greeks who addressed Philip saying, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. In John 12, 21, may we see him in his fullness so that others will see him in us. And now we turn to our vocation to serve Christ, the light of the world, who is king by a covenant of salt. It is clear from what we've explored that the role of Jesus as light of the world is firmly anchored in, in scripture, but the anchor of Jesus as a salty individual is a little more difficult to find and we've got to go to a very obscure portion of scripture, that is to Second Chronicles chapter 13 and verse 5. What a neglected book of scripture, of course, is Second Chronicles. They say, turn to the clean part of your Bible. Have you ever, ever heard that? You know, because the grubby bit, you know, the Psalms and the Gospels, New Testament, you know, the edge of the Bible gets a bit grubby because we're, we're forever there. But if you turn to the clean part of your Bible, as they say, There'll be this, these other portions of scripture that we have uh, not paid too much attention to. And certainly Second Chronicles is one of those books of scripture. We'll come to that in a moment. Let me say at the outset that Almighty God has raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms and we are co-heirs with him. So Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6 says that we are seated in the heavenly realms and Romans 8.17 says that we are co-heirs with Christ. That means that whatever Christ has inherited, we also inherit because we are co-heirs. I wish we could come to grips with this, who it is that we are in Christ. Paul says, I want to know Christ. Even Paul was prepared to speak about his own ignorance and uh, I think most of us are even more ignorant if that were possible. Paul says, I want to know Christ. What does it mean to be a Christian? It means that we are co-heirs with him. All of his titles, 
all of his majesty, all of his authority, all of his power, all of his calling, it comes to us as an inheritance because we are co-heirs with him. We inherit his mission, his power, his authority and fullness. We inherit it from the one who said of himself, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. John 8, 12. That means that we are constituted in him to shine with splendor. Would to God that the, the word splendor be associated with the Christian faith. Would to God that the way we conduct ourselves be one characterized by splendor. The splendor of light. The majesty of light. Why do we dress in, sh- in such a shabby way, some of us? Why are our cars so grubby? Why are our refrigerators <laughs> needing to be cleaned out? It's because we're not recognizing that we are sons of light. We're co-heirs with Christ. Majesty should be the word associated with Christians because we serve an exalted, risen, majestic saviour. And you don't have to be rich to be majestic. It's been said you could put Queen Elizabeth in a scarf, Wellington boots, and in a muddy field, and she'll still be royal because it's who she is. Would to God that we could live out who we are, whether we have much or little. The way we conduct ourselves, it's got really nothing to do with the material in that sense. Nevertheless, we should recognize that we are transforming the material by the spiritual. We are constituted in him to shine with splendor. And because the God of Israel, let me turn now to the passage, this uh, unusual passage in Second Chronicles, because the God of Israel, we read, has given the kingship of Israel to David and his descendants forever by a covenant of salt, we are to minister as those who belong to David's son, whose rule is founded with every good salty quality so I'll read those words again from second chronicles 13 5 the God of Israel has given the kingship of Israel to David and his descendants forever by a covenant of salt what is a covenant of salt a covenant of salt is a covenant an agreement an arrangement which has all those wonderful virtues of salt its value even as currency, that it penetrates, brings cleansing, healing, flavor, preservation, judgment, and life. Jesus, of course, is the son of David. And because we are co-heirs with him, then we are in Christ in that same manner. The kingship of Israel is given to David and his descendants including Jesus and therefore us. The kingship is given to us. We are a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And so we are to minister as those who belong to David's son, our Lord Jesus, our risen glorious Lord, whose rule is founded with every good salty quality. Now, Since the virtue of salt characterizes that covenant, by which Christ's kingship as Davidic Messiah is established, it should be seen in growing measure in my life and in yours because we are co-heirs as descendants of David. And the virtues of light which are found in Christ should similarly be seen in growing measure in my life and in yours. The foundation of Christ's influence as salt and our consequent ministry is the covenant of salt that he inherits and bequeaths. The basis of Christ's work as light and our subsequent role is that God is light. 1 John 1 5. Whose splendor was like the sunrise we read in the book of Habakkuk. With rays which flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. A glorious statement about the majesty of God in Habakkuk chapter 3. Again, turn to the clean part of your Bible, the book of Habakkuk. And finally, as we conclude today by giving this a practical dimension, we turn to our good old redhead matches and the candle. 
So as we speak words of salty quality, we see that we are living out all that God is calling us to do. Just like Jesus who, when he rescued that adulterous woman by his ruling, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone. He's, he's shining light as well by saying, leave your life of sin. There's that salty quality of ministry because he's bringing life, but he's also exposing the deeds of darkness by saying to her, leave your life of sin. Knowing our identity in Christ, our salty ministry penetrates to bring cleansing, healing, preservation, flavor, judgment, and life. And like him, we shine the light that exposes the deeds of darkness and illuminates the path of righteousness. So time to light the candle, I think. We've got a great example of speech that is seasoned with salt. And we've got action to shun the light of truth. Back in 1891, when the Salvation Army reformed the match industry, because the matches in those days were made using the deadly white or yellow phosphorus. And this match has red heads. This ma these matches have red heads. I'll light my candle here. Thank God these matches have red heads. You see, back in the day, in the 1890s and thereabouts, the workers who were making the matches were becoming sick and dying at work because they were breathing in the deadly, toxic, phosphorus fumes from that white and yellow phosphorus that was used to make the matches. So the matches used to have white heads and yellow heads. They'd get that terrible fossy jaw, they would call it, that necrosis as they were breathing in the fumes. The Salvation Army, as good Christian people, were outraged by this wickedness and demanded action by government. Well, with all due respect to governments, they don't always get it right. And the government of the day said, oh, well, we believe in free enterprise and f freedom of the market, and if people want to import something and work with it, well, so be it. Weaker Christians perhaps would have said, oh, well, we did our bit. We prayed and we, you know, we wrote to our member of parliament or whatever we did. We did something. And prayer is a good thing, so I was writing to the members of parliament. But action is even better. Incredibly, the Salvation Army took it upon itself to establish its own matchmaking factory because they were going to beat the industry at its own game. And in their factory, they would pay the workers properly instead of the slave labour, the sweat labour, as we call it, that was being paid or being hired, I should say, in the, in the Bryant and May match factory and these other factories. And they said, we'll have tea breaks and we'll have occupational health and safety and our factory will be a model factory and members of parliament will be shown around the factory to see how beautiful it is. But above all, we will not use the deadly yellow and white phosphorus but the much less problematic red phosphorus. Now this should be a recipe for bankruptcy. If you're going to take on an industry and you're going to pay the workers more and you're going to make life more difficult by occupational health, safety, tea breaks and everything else. But they had a secondary part to their response and that was encouraging all the people of Britain when you go shopping, demand from your shopkeeper matches which are safely made. And if you want to Google Salvation Army matches, you'll see the matchbox there. Uh, Lights in darkest England was written on the matchboxes and quotations from scripture, love your neighbour, etc. Uh, and you know, the, gospel, the gospel message was going out even in the matches. So this put huge pressure on the matchmaking industry such that the entire industry was transformed and at that point the Salvation Army was able to shut down its matchmaking factory because what do they care about matches? They've got other things to do. They had achieved their goal. The audacity, the brightness, the authenticity 
of the Salvation Army in that era thrills me. What denomination today would take on an entire industry to beat it at its own game and to impose with glorious love and authority the wisdom and work of Christ to bring reformation? What a story that is for us to consider. So speaking to shine those lights in darkest England, the Salvation Army persuaded people to buy only the safely made matches. Thus they reformed the entire industry, saving countless workers from death. Well, there we have it, my friends. Ministering as salt and light. This is who we are in him. All the good qualities of salt should characterize my life and yours. All the virtues of light should be seen in what we do. We serve Jesus who is the light of the world, whose kingship is established by a covenant of salt. May we go out into the world this week as his ambassadors who are glowing with his light. Let us be regarded as bright Christians who have the wonderful savour of salt in our speech and in our actions. In Jesus' name, amen.